give a brief history of our uh, keynote speaker and uh, just a few remarks before she gets started. So last summer, uh, the summer of 2013, we received the news of a not guilty verdict for the man responsible for the death of young Trayvon Martin. And this past su summer, we witnessed the tragic death of an unarmed 18-year-old African-American man who was shot and killed by police in Ferguson, Missouri. I watched in horror at the images of what looked like militant armies marching on protesters. And these events are outcomes of a deeply rooted racism that exists in our society and powerfully affects us all. Speaking to this issue tonight, Mrs. Edith Johnson Savage Jennings Long-time civil rights and social justice activist has joined us as our keynote speaker for our annual membership celebration and board installation. Mrs. Savage Jennings brings her inspiring message of social action, perseverance, and collaboration across color lines for what will hopefully be for you a powerful recommitment to our profession and to our work. A pioneer in the civil rights movement, Edith Johnson Savage Jennings has been continually honored for her many contributions by numerous local, state, and national organizations. A guest speaker at schools, colleges, and churches, she has been featured in over seven books and has appeared on local and national TV numerous times. She began her social justice and civil rights activism at the age of 13 when she led the integration of the Capitol Theater in Trenton, New Jersey. She is a product of Trenton Public Schools and attended Trenton State College and Rutgers University, where she studied early childhood education. She also earned certificates in public relations and juvenile justice and studied nonviolence at Hunter College. For 34 years, Mrs. Savage Jennings worked at the Mercer County Youth Detention Center and retired as the assistant superintendent. She received the national award for juvenile detention workers. Mrs. Savage Jennings co-founded the Trenton Chapter of Political Black Women and is a lifelong member of the NAACP and National Council of Negro Women. She was Vice President of the New Jersey State Conference of the NAACP, was a member of the National Urban League Youth Council, co-founder of the Metropolitan Urban League of Trenton, founder of the Metropolitan Urban League Guild of Trenton, the Urban League's Young People for Progress, and Regional Vice President of the National Eastern, Eastern Urban League. Mrs. Savage Jennings was the founder of the Mercy County Chapter of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1960, where she served as its president, one of only two female presidents for this organization. In 1957, the Reverend S. Howard Woodson, president of the Trenton area NAACP and first African American speaker of the New Jersey legislature, asked Mrs. Savage Jennings to chair a civil rights rally at Shiloh Baptist Church for the benefit of the SCLC. She invited Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. to speak, which inspired the people and garnered national attention to the Mercer County chapter. She coordinated three marches on Trenton as part of the Poor People's Campaign, which include the march from the Battle Monument to Trenton Central High School, where participants were met with police dogs. Mrs. Savage Jennings served as the coordinator of the Mid-Atlantic State's Poor People's Campaign of the SCLC in 1968. She produced the Freedom Concerts throughout the country at the request of Mrs. King as fundraisers for the SCLC. She was one of the co-organizers of the New Jersey Democratic Coalition in 1964. That same year, she was asked to join Fannie Lou Hamer in attending the Democratic Party Convention in Atlantic City as the first non-delegate to receive a pass to appear on the convention floor. When Ms. Hamer left the convention for a protest, Mrs. Savage Jennings followed her, along with several other delegates. She has been a White House guest in the administrations of Presidents Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, Bush Sr., and Clinton, and the driving force behind the appearance of outstanding speakers throughout the country. A close friend of Eleanor Roosevelt, Mrs. Savage Jennings was invited to an Easter egg hunt at the White House during President Roosevelt's first term. 
and she and Mrs. Roosevelt corresponded over the course of two decades. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy recruited Mrs. Savage Jennings and Mrs. Helen Minor, the wife of New Jersey Governor Robert Minor, to go on a secret mission to Jackson, Mississippi to meet with public officials and women in the Jackson community to offset rioting due to integration of the first grade classrooms. It was the first time that an African American and, white wo and a white woman worked and traveled together in Mississippi. They also traveled to Hattiesburg to retrieve letters from incarcerated college students who were helping to register black Mississippians to vote. The efforts of Mrs. Savage Jennings and Mrs. Minor were later included with those of the project Wednesdays in Mississippi. In 2004, Mrs. Savage Jennings was presented with Rosa Parks Congressional Medal of Honor at the National State and City Dinner in her honor in New Jersey. For over 25 years, Mrs. Savage Jennings was a board member of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolence and Social Change in Atlanta. In 1986, she lobbied with New Jersey Governor Kane to create the first King Commission in the country, the New Jersey Martin Luther King Jr. Commemorative Commission, where she serves as permanent commissioner. Mrs. Savage Jennings lobbied to make Trenton the first city and New Jersey among the first states to observe a Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. As a personal friend and advisor to New Jersey's last eight governors, both Democratic and Republican, Mrs. Savage Jennings has been instrumental in increasing the power and presence of women and minorities throughout local and state government. In 2009, Mrs. Savage Jennings was inducted into the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, where several, several of her historic documents, papers, and other items are on display. The collection represents more than three quarters of a century of social justice work organizational affiliations, and groundbreaking initiatives advancing civil rights in her local community in Trenton, New Jersey, as well as on statewide and national levels. On June 27, 2014, only a few days before the 50th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the founders of the Museum of Women's Resistance in Brooklyn were proud to name the museum the Edith Savage Jennings Museum in her honor. Mrs. Savage Jennings' own history includes images such as those we saw recently in Ferguson, which only speaks to the fact that we cannot look at civil rights efforts as, as something that was finished in the 1960s. Instead, social workers today need to be on the front lines in advancing civil rights with a warm welcome and immense respect for her work and for taking the time to be with us tonight, I introduce to you Mrs. Edith Johnson Savage Jim. I feel comfortable because I worked with social workers 34 years of my life. I had a social worker every day, sometimes during the night. So I'm very familiar with what you do. And I want to tell you, you do work that many people would never do. So you should be proud. You have to give yourself an applause. You know, I'm different from maybe most speakers you've heard, so you don't have to bear with me. I do it my way. I do it my way. And when I was a little girl, 10, going on 11, the New Jersey State Federation of Public Women's Clubs, the oldest black organization in the state, had asked my mother, she was a member. Could I do them a favor? <laughs> my mother said, what is it? And we'd like for her to present the flowers to Mrs. Roosevelt. And I did just that. But she's not supposed to say anything. 
she's just supposed to present the flowers. Well, I kept saying to myself all the way to Boydentown, New Jersey, at the manual training school, I'm not deep, I'm not dumb. Why can't I say something? So I said, Mrs. Roosevelt, on behalf of the Women's Organization, Black Women, State of New Jersey, I'm happy to present you these flowers. But I also want you to know and thank you for being so nice to color people. Well, I wish you could have been there that day. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm in trouble tonight. <laughs> but that became a lasting friendship up until she died. Two months before she died, I was in New York with her where she spoke. And I used to go to the White House so the president would say to me, you know, we want to adopt you. I said, I don't think that's going to happen. I'm sure it's not going to happen. But I was friendly with her children, and we just had a wonderful time together. So that was my first encounter with the president. And after that, I now we missed the president. I'm sorry. We missed President Obama, who honored me in 2013. So what I'm trying to say is that you may walk with people of stature. But I always remain humble. I think you can get more done if you're humble than trying to say, oh, you're this, or you're that. That's not important to me. It was always the mission that was important to me. And I went on to do several things. I served on the board. No, no, I integrated the theater. I keep forgetting about that. It's been so long. But I integrated the theater in Trenton. And what happened, most of you know David Dinkins, first black bear of New York. Well, he was a childhood playmate of mine. And Dr. Mr. Haley, who was Tuskegee Airman, we were all in, in WCP youth chat. So one Saturday when we met, our advisor said, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to integrate the theater, because I'm tired of going to the balcony. I'm allergic to it. She said, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. So I kept saying, you know, why can't it happen? So I said to David, to Les, Dr. Haley, you know, we're going to integrate the theater today. They said, you're going to do what? <laughs> I said, today is the day we're going to integrate the theater. So we went in the theater, bought our tickets, sat down, the second row from the stage. And so the usher came. He said, you're in the wrong seats. So nobody said anything. So he said, you're in the wrong seats. I said, well, we're not moving. And we sat there. And the manager came. He said, you're in the wrong seat. You must go to the balcony. So David nudged me. He said, so, you're the spokesman now. This is your show. <laughs> 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 I said, uh, I'm sorry, sir, but we're not moving. And we didn't move. We sat there through the whole movie, walked out peacefully. Then we decided to go back. I decided to go back, not there. I decided to go back with them the next Saturday. We went back the next Saturday. No usher came, no manager came. So I said to them, well, I guess we integrated the theater. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my early years were really productive. Because I think you really learn a lot if you listen. And I was raised in a household where my mother was involved in politics had no dad, I was offered it too. But I had an aunt that thought it not robbery to take her sister's six children, bring them to New Jersey, where she was a mortician working on taking dates in Trenton, New Jersey, and raise them, adopt them. But I want them to keep their name, that's what she told the judge. They have a name that I'm proud they have. It. So I'm a product of James Weldon Johnson, who was my dad's first cousin, Jack Johnson, boxer, who was also my dad's first cousin. And so I think I have a sort of rich history. And then on top of that, I had an Irish pure grandfather and an Indian grandmother pure. My mother just happened to marry a black man. And they said, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I'm all mixed up. <laughs> so maybe that's why I'm like I am. But the history that I want to bring to you about civil rights is actually what I'm here tonight for. When I met Dr. Martin Luther King in 1957, and what happened, as I think you read in my history, the Reverend Woodson had called and says, there's a friend of mine in Atlanta who's in trouble. 
I said, what kind of trouble? He said, she can't raise no money. Nobody's giving any money for the new baby. So I told him I had someone here if she could do it. At the time, I was getting ready to get married. And I said to Reverend Woodson, I don't think I can do this. I'm getting ready to get married. He says, please, please, just do me this favor. So I did. So that evening, when I met Dr. King at a social event we had for him after, he says, are you the Edith that's friendly with Dr. and Mrs. Marion and Alpha Logan in New York? I said, yes, I am. So he said, so, well, they told us so much about you. So I'm just happy to meet you. And I was wondering if you would do me a favor. <laughs> I said, oh, here I go again, doing a favor. <laughs> so I says, Dr. King, I'm getting ready to get married. <laughs> I can't tell you yes, I can't tell you no. He says, well, I'm desperately in need of a fundraiser throughout the country, throughout the state, wherever. So I said, well, I'll do about it. So one month went by, he called me. He says, have you thought about it? I said, I discussed it with my husband. He said, fine with him, but just find you a chauffeur, because I'm not going to be a chauffeur, because I've never driven in my life. Well, I was lucky. I had friends that drove and didn't mind to go around with me. And I took on the job of raising the funds. But I want to tell you, Jersey, this, you got to be proud. New Jersey supported the movement more than anybody in this country, mm -hmm. the state of New Jersey. And I want to personally thank you. Listen, you, because you're all young. <laughs> they really support it. And I just feel that um, it's, it's emotional for me to have to speak. I get emotional about all this because it's friends, and, you know, very good friends. The Kings were my dear friends. His dad adopted me into the family in 1966. And he said to his congregation that Sunday, I want you to meet our new daughter. Mrs. King and I have adopted her into our family. And so now she's Martin's sister, Christina's sister, and A.D. And I was shocked, because I was sitting there with Mrs. King. And I said, who's he talking about? <laughs> so she said, you better stand up. So I stood up. But that was a real warm, warm relationship. And I can tell you, I want to tell you about Dr. King, since I knew him personally, stayed with him. Go with it to the man. I never did anywhere else in the land but with them. Dr. King was, as far as I'm concerned, the 20th century prophet of our times. We don't know it, but history goes down further and further. You'll understand what I'm saying. Dr. King was the most gentle, understanding, took time to talk to the milkman. He would get up and meet him. Never, 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 never was above anybody. He always felt that I'm equal. I'm doing this for a cause. And this is something that most people don't know. The greatest speech he ever made was one that was never recorded. He called all of his lieutenants, as we call them, into a mound, to a meeting. And he says, so, I don't want this recording, I kept saying to the secretary, I don't want this speech recorded. And I said, that's strange, because we record everything he says. And he said, I just don't want it. And when he talked about the Poor People's Campaign, it was just, it was something that he just sit there and said, my God, if we could only accomplish that mission, how great it would be. So I've always felt, the reason I feel this way about it, when he went to Memphis, he called that morning, Mrs. King had called me, we were going to be in New York. He said, let me talk to Sister Eden. And I said, Martin, get the plane, you're always late to go get the plane. He said, no, promise me something. He said, if anything should happen to me, you stay close to Coretta and the children. I said, Martin, just go on. I don't have any money. I'll see you in Newark next week. I have an engagement for you. And just go get the plane. He said, no, I'm not going until you promise. I said, I promise you. But never did I think the next day he'd be assassinated. 
but he knew. That's why he asked me to promise him. And when I think about the sacrifices he made, he died poor. No money. If you give him any money, it went all to the movement. Money was not the issue with him. It was the cause. And most people think, oh, Dr. King was this and that. Dr. King was the most humble, unassuming individual we ever know, one of the great speakers I've ever heard. And he said to me when I was there visiting about the Vietnam War. In fact, he said to me, get up early in the morning, because I know you don't get up. Get up. I want to talk to you before I leave. And he says, you know, you keep telling me about you can't raise money because I'm objecting to the Vietnam War. He says, well, don't worry about it. I will never change my position in Vietnam. And I said, I understand, Martin. I said, but it's hard to convince other people why you feel the way you do. He said, well, I'm sorry. I feel this way. I'm not going to change. I said, OK, I'll do the best I can. I'll get it from somewhere. But New Jersey would always come through. If I needed some major money, I could go to any of the corporates and give it to me. And it was amazing. I, one day I said, you know what, I'm going to see Mr. Rockefeller. <laughs> and I went to see him. And he says, certainly I'll be happy to contribute. And we were very much in need of that money at that time. But I'm trying to say that Dr. King, if he had lived, it would have been a massive change in America. That's why he was assassinated. They knew in Poor People's Campaign, come to Washington as we had planned and talked about what was actually going on in America <clears throat> that most of you don't know anything about and probably never will. That's why he was assassinated. And I'm sure that's the reason. But going on, leaving Martin now, talking about his will, this Greg Scott King, who was my best friend. We went to a board meeting one morning in Memphis, right after the assassination. So they said to her, oh, Mrs. King, we want you to go home, take care of your four little four children, and we'll be there if you need us, and so forth. And I sit there with her right next to And I said, I can't believe they're saying this. And they're not offering to help. Come see about your children. We're not doing any of that, so we're upstairs to the suite. And I said, Fred, why didn't you say anything? She says, I didn't say anything because his name shall never die. That's going to be my mission. He's dead, but not the name, not what he stood for. So I said, well, how are you going to do that? She says, trust me. When I'm finished my plan, I'll call you. And she did one day. She says, I'm going to have the Martin Luther King Center for nonviolent social change and all that. I said, well, where are we going to get the money from? She said, you're going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK, I had to work out a plan. And I did. I worked out a plan. And I was able to help Ports, they are the ones who really contributed heavily to that center. And we were able to get the money. But now, you remember when they begged all of you to put Martin in Washington? Well, that put the center in trouble, in trouble. Because they put all the money, and I can understand it, they wanted to see him on the money. And that's where he is. It's a wonderful, wonderful statue. But the center is suffering because that's where the money went. So now we're in a crisis. And I keep saying, Bernie, I'm getting too old <laughs> to go around and travel around the country. She says, well, I need to work out something. But I'm just saying to say this, that the center needs money. And if you can contribute, it would be great. But that's not really everything I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about Yvonne Martin, which was one of America's disgraces, an unarmed kid. And somebody just comes up, start an argument with him, and suddenly kill him, and claim that he was aggressive, which was not true. I heard his mother speak, 
where she had urgently convention, and she brought tears to your eyes. This thing, her son, going on 16, had gotten killed. Never had a chance to really get a high school education or to go to college. But then when I thought about Ferguson, young Brown, Michael Brown, here we are again in the same situation one year. We have killed another student getting ready to go off to school. The next day, he was going. And I said, here we are again. What is wrong? Then I thought about when I went around to the police stations in New Jersey and New York and talking to the chiefs and so forth. And I said, what you need to do is have a nonviolent training class for your officers. We don't need that. I said, yes, you did desperately. You need it. I said, because I work with police officers. They come into my facility. And sometimes I find kids are beat up when they come through that door. My answer is take them to the hospital. We have three. Take them to one, not here. They'll never say they got hurt here. Oh, oh, we, we can't do that, we're too busy. I said, you don't come in. They don't come in until I know exactly what's wrong with them. So we've always had racist police officers in America, unfortunately. But they did not want to do the nonviolent training. That would have been part of the solution if they had the course. But if you, say for instance, we were going through the New Jersey where the state troopers were stopping by drivers, the same thing. They used to call it fun, because I have a friend that was a state trooper. They said they was having fun doing that. But they didn't realize what it was doing to the people that they were picking on. I thought picking on, because they were black. So I'm going to say it's been a long, long, long journey of racism. And all because of the Civil War, when you want to, believe it or not. The Civil War turned blacks away from slavery. And that was one of the worst things that could ever happen. At that time, as far as they were concerned, they were losing the nannies, they were losing <coughs> the sharecroppers, they were losing everything. And they had lived this, they still live it. Now, I'm going to tell you, when President Kennedy called me, <coughs> and he said to me, Mrs. Savage, I was Savage, then, my first husband. I said, President Kennedy. <laughs> I thought it was a joke. I really did. Because normally when a president had called, he was through his chief of staff or someone. I had never talked directly, except to President Roosevelt and President Carter, which I'll tell you about. But anyhow, he says, I have something I want you to do for me. And I want to be secret. That's why I'm calling you myself. It has to be secret. I want you and Mrs. Minor <coughs> to go into Mississippi for me. It's a crucial time. And I said, you know what, President Kennedy, I have a little boy that's four years old. And I really want to see him. I want to be able to see him go. <coughs> he said, no, just think about it. And I'll call you back in a week's time. And I thought about it, and I said, well, this is what you do. And my husband said, that's exactly what you do. <laughs> so I says, well, I don't know. He said, no, I will take off and take care of Stephen while you're gone, so you don't have to worry about that. And I said, well, I've got a job. He said, well, just tell him the president wants you to go somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be OK. So anyhow, we prepared. But what happened in the meantime, President Kennedy got assassinated. So I said, oh, my gosh. I said to Mrs. Biden, well, we don't have to go now. But after President Johnson came in office, he called. And he says, I want to carry out the President Kennedy's mission. I understand from Bobby what the mission was. And it is secret, and I know that. And we're going to make sure it stays secret. 
So Mrs. Ronnie and I went to Mississippi. Well, I couldn't believe what was happening. We stepped off the plane. There were men there, spitting on the floor in front of us. And I said, this is going to be a secret. Yeah. But that wasn't the point. Never before had a black woman and a white woman come off the plane talking, socializing with each other. So I said, you know what? Oh, and I hope we can make it out of this airport. So he had sent in some of the uh, Secret Service men to be with us while we were there. They didn't know that. So they were in a car where we went. They followed us. So I said to Mrs. Meyer, I said, you know what? I'm thinking about maybe going back home. <laughs> so she says, well, we'll stick it out. And we did, we stuck it out. Our mission was first to make sure that it was going to have a peaceful integration because they were kindergarten children. So one of the women, a Mississippi white woman, because of Mrs. Minor, not me, held this afternoon tea with all the prominent women and so forth in Mississippi. So Mrs. Minor said, you know what, you're the spokesman, not me. I said, oh, yes, that's why they have this. It's for you. It's not for me, I'm sure. <laughs> and if you saw the help, it was doing that era. And the help was exactly the way it was. And the help would turn out and peep at me because it wasn't sure this black woman was sitting in the living room. So I said to them, I said, you know, I'm going to make this very simple. I'm not going to make a long speech. I'm just going to say you have the power. Women have the power to do anything they want to do if they want to do it. And we're little children. I'm sure you would want to be traumatized by having men and women kissing and doing all the things they do, and yelling out near this. And that sort of thing. I'm not sure you would want it. So why don't you do us a favor this evening and talk to your husband? Then call your brothers or your uncles and so forth and say, This is not going to be, we're not going to have this. And I'm saying, I'm praying. <laughs> I prayed too, I prayed that night. And it happened. And they integrated the schools, it was a peaceful integration. So then he said to us, the President had talked about this, Kennedy, let's go into Hattiesburg because the students that went down to register to vote had been thrown in jail. So we went to Hattiesburg, and the worst jails I've ever seen in anywhere were jail. And so I said, we come to see the students, and they said, what students? I said, the students that you have in jail from the north that were registering, but they allowed us to see them. So I already sent word by Fanny Lou because I knew her, I belonged to an organization with her. So I said, do you know anybody that works in the jail that can do me a favor? She says, I think I do. I said, you take a janitor or something and make sure he has some paper that he can give them and ask them to write to their parents and I'll do the rest once I get there. So they let us see them. So they came out and we talked to them and all. And I said, did you write the letters? They said, yes. I said, write down, fold them up, very small, and let me have them. So I was prepared. I wore something with no arms, low cut, and so forth and so on. And I will tell you the rest of the gentleman in the room. <laughs> so I got the letters out <laughs> of the jail, and I handed them to the Secret Service so they could send them immediately to the president. And while we were there, I said to Mrs. Mine, I think I'd like to go see Fannie Lou because she's running the school. Well, when we got to that school, I can't describe these poor little children, raggedy clothes. Some of the boys and girls didn't have shoes on. And I said, is this what you have to She says, I don't have enough money to clothe them, but I want them in school. And I said to Mrs. Minor, you know, I'm going back home. 
I'm going to make sure that he sends some clothes and shoes down Mississippi for those children. So I went and begged every merchant I knew. And some I didn't know. I need clothes. I gave them the sizes of what I needed. I need shoes. And we boxed them and sent them to Mississippi. The Fannie and Hamer was one of the greatest women of all the movement women. Her mission was that we're going to I say to the convention. <coughs> we're going to be seated. And that's what she done. But what happened? The Democratic person, not the person, the chair of the Democratic Party in Satan, New Jersey, they called and asked me, well, I host her since I knew her while she was in Atlantic City. I said, oh, I'd be happy to. And I did. And so the day we were getting ready to go to the convention for his opening day, I said, Pamela, are you really up to this? She says, I think I am. So we went, I sat right next to her. She had the seat on me, and I was the next seat. And so when they were calling for the role, they called the white delegation, seated them, never said a word about the black delegation. So she says, Mr. Chairman, we're here to be seated. He was ignoring her, as if she wasn't talking. So finally, another delegate from another state, I forgot the state now, the option said, the lady from Mississippi wanted to be heard, and she is a delegate. So she got on the floor, and she made this great speech. And then she decided to walk out after she made the speech. And I walked behind her and the other delegates. She got out on the boardwalk, and she looked at the ocean, and she said, you know, it's so sad, so sad, that they don't understand that we're human beings. I just said, Fanny, just don't, don't, don't think about it now. I know it hurts. It's hurting me. So I said, but it's going to make a difference in the Democratic Party before it's all over. And what I've done, I came back home, and I called Stanley Van Ness, who's the public advocate, and Dick Leone, who was the senator then. I said, I want you to come to my home. We're going to do something about what happened to Fannie and Atlantic City. They said, like what? I said, first thing, we're going to start in New Jersey. We're going to call anybody who want to come to this rally. We're going to have it at Rutgers University, which we did, and we packed it. And I told them, I said, you know, thinking about it, here in New Jersey, we don't have any black candidates, right? I said, that's the thing I thought about. Why I had not a clue, but we didn't. So I said, we have to do this. We have to let them know that this is no longer going to go in New Jersey. So we did, and believe it or not, we got our first candidate. But it's been a long, long journey, a very long journey. I can sit here and tell you all kinds of stories, things that I've done. But I know the hour is getting late, and I thought maybe some of you might like to ask a question. But I can tell you, at the end of the day, I ask myself all the time, was it worth the struggle? Sometimes I think maybe it was. Sometimes I think maybe it wasn't. But I do know this, that education is a right for every student. Every child in America deserves an equal education. I can tell you this, I went to the State Board of Education some, well, 40 some years ago. And more than that, I guess now, because Barnes been dead 50. And I said, why don't you write in the curriculum about what we're doing? I said, it's a part of its history. I said, I'll help you write it if you need it. So they listen, they listen. So I called back, I've been calling now. Here it is, 2014, I'm still calling. <laughs> to have them in, in the curriculum, civil rights, it's still not there. You know, what is wrong, and I hate to say this, but the suburbans don't want to hear it, but they called me to come speak, doing Martin Luther King. 
week. And I go straight to them and they treat me great. But it stops there. That's the end of it. We did what we had to do. But until we do this, it's like we teach about Columbus discovering America. This is all American history. Why can't we be a part of it? So I'm going to leave you tonight by saying, I thank you for listening. And those of you that are so, social workers, I want to thank you again. I work with, not maybe some of you, but I work with a lot of social workers. And I, I had to say this. I hate knifers with a passion. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, I do. I hate it with a passion. Because they have turned out some horrible children. I put them in foster homes. You know, in India, and I know this to be a fact, they have one home, and if that home is grandmothers, grandfathers, mother and father, sometimes an aunt and uncle. They make it a family. And all the children live in this big, beautiful house, just like any other child's house. It's such a difference. They go to school from a family that cares. Here we put them anywhere. Somebody needs some money, they decide they're going to be a foster parent is the worst thing in the world. When I was a little girl, we had residents that lived down the street from us. The children of their own, they had foster children. When I would go down some time and have lunch, she would feed us. Foster children stayed upstairs. And after we were finished, foster children came down and ate. And I said to my mother, I don't want to eat there no more. Because we all can't eat together. Well, I was a little crazy, you know. They said, and my sisters and my brother said, you know, we think my mother got you at the garbage can. I said, well, maybe she did. I said, but I'm not going to go there and eat no more when all the children can't eat together. But I'm going to tell you that if I was a social worker and knew that was going on, she wouldn't have those children. You know what? That would be the end of that. But you have a tremendous job. A tremendous job. And I know it's not easy. But I thank you for listening. And maybe I can come again. Yeah. I'm 90. I don't mind telling the story. And I still have all my faculties. I can remember everything since I was two years old. And that is a blessing. But thank you, Madam President. Where are you? <laughs> Much. I'm so glad that you're able to attend and really witness this rare opportunity to hear from Mrs. Uh, Edith Savage Jennings and uh, really hear from one of our nation's most important advocates for racial equality. I know it was personally inspiring and moving for me. I know that it recommits us to our work as social workers. And I just ask that you join me one more time in thanking Mrs. Savage Jennings for an incredible experience.